but it's never really kind of inclined to go look at it. Uh, so what this uh, what this talk is about is is um, kind of goes in behind the, the covers of that. So um, if you've done thread programming in Python, you know that there is this global interpreter lock, and uh, you probably know that it imposes a lot of restrictions on what you can do with threads. Namely, um, it means that you can't use multiple CPUs or run on multiple cores. And so because of that, it's often a frequent uh, sort of subject of various sort of flame wars about Python, about, okay, Python sucks because of X, you know, and they'll throw in like the gill, and then you throw in lambda and uh, white space and anything else that comes to mind. It sort of uh, shows up there. Actually, I think any discussion on any of those topics will automatically include the other like three or four topics at some point. So um, there, there is that. Um, and then just as a disclaimer before I get into this, um, I'm just going to admit that the, the gill itself does not actually really bother me that much as a programmer. That might um, be a little bit of sort of a heretical uh, statement, but to, to be kind of honest, I actually don't really have hugely strong feelings about it either way. I mean, it's, if it were to go away, that would be fine, but if it were to stick around, that's, that's sort of fine too. I think part of that is I'm a little bit biased um, for doing sort of parallel computing stuff. I'm, I personally am more into message passing than threads. So, I mean, you, you know, it kind of depends on the problem, but that's my own bias. Uh, but one of the things that I kind of found is that the gill has some pretty odd and surprising behavior if you go to multi-core systems, like, uh, like this dual-core laptop or anything that has multiple cores. Uh, there's some pretty interesting stuff going on. So uh, that's kind of what I want to talk about. And actually, just to jump right into this, um, this, is, this is probably not the most interesting Python code. But what this is, is it's just a trivial CPU-bound function that just counts down from some number. Uh, and then if you just run this function, so if you just run it twice in a series like that, and then you run it in parallel in two threads, and then you look at the performance of that, what do you expect the what do you expect the result to be? I mean, does anybody? Yeah, I mean, I I've been programming for a while. I know that Python cannot run on multiple cores, so you know my gut feeling on it is like, well, it's probably going to be about the same. Okay, I mean, it's okay. So I'm running two threads, but I'm running like back to back. It'd be about the same. Um, on dual core systems, it's not the same. In fact, uh, it runs almost twice as slow. Um, I actually find that to be a pretty surprising result. It's like, you have, to, you have to think about that for a minute. It's like, okay, going from sequential to threads on a two core, on like a two CPU system runs twice as slow as not using threads. And then on top of that, why is this going on? Um, I found out my, you know, there's a way to disable one of the cores on your laptop. So if I turn off the other core, why, do, why does the thread version now run faster than it did with two, two cores? I mean, this, I mean I, I've done a lot of systems programming in C and other languages, but this, this does not make any logical sense of any kind of parallel programming that I've ever seen. So uh, if you think about that for a second, it's, uh, I don't know, it's kind of mysterious as to what's going there. And I'll just sort of say that I don't really like unexplained mysteries like that. I mean, maybe I need to get maybe get out more, um, but as, uh, you know, it's like, as, 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 you know, as part of this, I ran this concurrency class in May, and this sort of came up, uh, you know, when I was preparing that class, one of the things I wanted to do was talk more about the gill, because I honestly didn't know a whole lot about it myself, kind of ran into this, and then just went down this rabbit hole for about three weeks, trying to figure out what is going on with the gill, and that actually went all the way into looking at the source code for p-threads. I'm actually a little bit ashamed to admit that, but like trying to chase down uh, what was going on, uh, I downloaded like the source of the p-threads library and was looking at that. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of jump into this. Um, I think you'll sort of see some things about Python, sort of how the interpreter is actually put together and sort of what uh, is the source behind that pretty odd performance. So to just kind of jump into this, uh, so Garrett mentioned this earlier, uh, Python threads are actually real system threads. Uh, this is actually a, a misperception that I sometimes see like on blog posts and things like that. Somebody will kind of go on and they'll say, well, Python is crippled because it doesn't have real threads and, you know, whatever. Uh, that's actually not true. I mean, Python is using real live system threads, p-threads, Windows threads, 
Uh, those threads are actually fully managed by the operating system. Um, and what you actually have is, is actually real threaded execution of the Python interpreter. I mean, the interpreter is using threads. They're real threads. Uh, it's not some kind of weird, hacked, bogus thing in the, in the Python virtual machine or anything. Uh, as far as what happens when you uh, create threads in Python, um, if you're familiar with the interface, typically what you do is you define a class and then you implement you know, this run method uh, to basically launch a thread. Um, essentially what a Python thread does is it's just a thread that runs whatever that callable is. That's it. And if you look at the, the, the implementation of this, um, there's actually not a whole lot going on. Um, Basically, what the interpreter does is it actually creates a really tiny C data structure that has a little bit of interpreter state. It then just basically fires off a P thread, and then it just calls some C function, pi eval call object. That's basically a function in the, uh, in the interpreter C API that just runs some Python callable. That's it. Um, so when you launch a thread in Python, that's basically the whole setup on that one slide. I mean, there's nothing, there's no fancy scheduling. There's not really anything going on in the virtual machine. Um, if you kind of look at, at what gets created, um, as far as thread state, there's also not a whole lot going on. Uh, basically, this is kind of what the, what the interpreter stores for every thread that you create. Um, so there's sort of um, you know, some information about what stack frame you're executing in. Uh, there's some information about recursion, exception handling. Uh, if you actually look at the C data structure for this, this is what it looks like. Uh, that's actually the whole data structure there. Um, and uh, it's not so important to go into, into details on it, but some of the things that you see are mainly things like exception handling, um, some thread ID, tracing, uh, so forth. Uh, so one thing uh, that so, sort of about this that I guess I don't really have a slide on it, creating a Python thread in Python is actually an extremely lightweight operation. I mean, it's literally, it's just like fire a P thread and then call the C function, and then you're sort of off and running, uh, running with threads in the interpreter. Now, where it starts to get interesting uh, is, is really getting into this, this global interpreter lock, obviously. Um, basically, inside the interpreter, there's a global variable that just points to whatever thread is currently running. Um, and the fact that this is a, a global variable, I mean, is some clue as to you know, sort of how this locking business is going on in the interpreter. Um, essentially, what happens uh, is that everything that's sort of in the interpreter sort of implicitly is tied to whatever thread is currently executing. And that thread is basically controlled by this so-called global interpreter lock. So inside the interpreter, there's this locking mechanism that basically prevents more than one thread from actually executing uh, inside the interpreter. Uh, and some of the reasons given for that, I mean, it obviously sort of simplifies, you know, maybe the implementation of the interpreter. Uh, it certainly simplifies dealing with C extension code. So, I mean, if you're writing like C extensions in Python, you never have to worry about that uh, code being triggered from multiple threads or anything like that. Uh, so that's kind of the setup uh, as to how threads are, are actually kind of put together in Python as far as, you know, they, they're basically launched into P threads. There's a couple simple uh, interpreter structures uh, and so forth. Is everybody okay so far? Okay. Now, where it starts to get uh, kind of interesting with this um, is actually the behavior of this gill object. So. Uh, I'm going to go into some detail about how the interpreter is kind of put together with that um, and to sort of see how it works. So uh, at a really high level, the behavior of this gill is actually really easy to understand. Um, basically, if a thread is running, it holds on to the gill. So if you're running in the interpreter, you own that, that, that global interpreter lock. But then... Uh, Inside the interpreter, if you do any kind of I.O. operation, like you read on a file, you read on a socket, you, you do any kind of system call that's going to block, uh, the C code for Python has actually been written in a way that the gil is basically released. So if you're running you know, up here and then you do a read on a file, for instance, uh, basically the, the uh, interpreter will release the gil while that read operation is taking place. Uh, and at that point, 
uh, if there are other threads, they're actually allowed to run at that point. So uh, what ends up happening for any like single thread in Python is it tends to alternate between this uh, sort of acquire and release of this global interpreter lock. I mean, basically, if you're running, you have the lock. If you're going to block on I.O., uh, you release the lock, and then other things are sort of allowed to run at that point. So yes? Not necessarily just for I.O., though, right? You can, you can release it for whatever you want, so long as you know that whatever it is that you're doing isn't going to be messing with it. Right. The, the, the comment up here, um, there are, you know, like, if you know that you're not going to be doing anything in the interpreter, it's possible, for instance, in C extension modules to release the gill and then to run sort of concurrently in C programming land. Um, I think NumPy does, a, does some of that for some of, the, uh, some of the functions that it has. Yeah, NumPy, I think, uh, I'm actually not positive about all of NumPy, but it's, it's, it's an obvious candidate for doing that kind of thing. So... Uh, you know, if you have C extension modules, actually um, know about the Actually, one, one module that does release the gill is the C types library. So uh, if you call C functions using C types, which uh, if you have not done, I highly recommend, by the way, um, it, uh, that does release the global interpreter lock when it calls, uh, calls into C code. I think there's a way to tell it not to do that, but by default, yeah, it does that. Uh, but if you look at this at this behavior, um, essentially what you're getting is kind of a cooperative multitasking going on here. I mean, it's basically you're alternating between I/O and running, uh, and then you know sort of releasing and acquiring the uh, global interpreter lock. All right, any questions about that before it uh, goes off the deep end here? <laughs> okay. Now, uh, the more interesting case uh, really concerns the fact, uh, basically the behavior of threads if they don't do any I.O. Now, uh, admittedly, this is not always the most common case in Python, but uh, it is possible to have a thread that's just going to sit there and pound on the CPU doing a lot of processing. And uh, to deal with that, the interpreter basically implements uh, sort of a scheme where it periodically performs this so-called check. Uh, you might be familiar with this function in the sys module for Python. There's this library function uh, set check interval. Uh, if you read the documentation on it, it sort of vaguely says that it's uh, related to the global interpreter lock and threading and maybe some, some things of that nature. Uh, but what is happening inside the interpreter is that if you have some thread that just sits there and pounds on the CPU, uh, it's going to get interrupted every hundred ticks. And I'm going to actually talk about what a tick is in a second. Uh, then a little bit of periodic checking uh, takes place, and then it continues to run at this point. And so uh, what that check interval is, uh, so one, one thing that is, it's, it's not really documented very well about what in the world that, that, that check interval does or how it behaves. Uh, basically what that is is inside the interpreter, there's actually a global counter that is actually totally independent of thread scheduling. Uh, it actually has nothing whatsoever to do with threads. Um, essentially what that counter does is it just counts down every single time the virtual machine in Python executes an instruction or a tick. And if it hits zero, you do this check. Um, turns out that underneath the covers, um, you can actually have all sorts of threads, set, like basically scheduling and context switching occurring in between those, uh, in between those uh, check intervals. Uh, so, so underneath the covers, basically the interpreter is just sitting there. Every 100 ticks, it does this so-called check uh, and then just sort of carries on uh, what it's doing. And as far as what this periodic check is all about, what is going on there um, is really actually Python's kind of hook into uh, both signal handling and thread switching. Um, essentially what happens in, that, um, in this check here, uh, that's when Python actually uh, will execute uh, signal handlers. So if you hit, for instance, the control C key, uh, that generates a signal. Um, that code will execute. 
Um, one other thing that I'll, I'll say more about this in a second, signal handlers in Python basically only run in the main execution thread. So uh, one really horrible thing that you can do to make your brain explode basically is to mix like signal handling and thread programming together. <laughs> so have you, have you done, how, how did it work no, no, out? No, do it in C++, it's the best. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. So, so what happens in C++ besides all the other good things? In, in C++, there are a number of libraries, some open source, some commercial that says that they do it the same way that Python does. It says, you know, there's this, there'll be these extra extra mechanisms and the, only the main thread or the thread that you designate, which, you know, would be the main thread normally, will get signals. And that way if you're off in, you know, database thread or web thread, you won't get a signal, except you will. And then generally, well, all hell breaks loose. Yeah. Uh, sort of mixing threads and signals is sort of a well-known thing not to do. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a thread book that didn't recommend not or recommend against doing that. Uh, Python is at least trying to, well, it has some sanity to it and tries to only handle signals in one thread, but uh, there's actually some issues with that that we'll see in a second. Um, as far as the other thing with this periodic check, um, it turns out that, the, that in this little check period here, uh, there is a little hook that basically allows the interpreter to do thread switching. And it's a little bit subtle as to how it works, but basically the way that Python thread switches is it just has a thread, just releases the gill, and then it just immediately reacquires it. Um, I actually think I have code that shows this. Is, this, this is basically some code from, in, from the uh, internals of the Python interpreter. Um, it literally releases the lock and reacquires the lock in like two successive C function calls. So down here it's basically release the lock and then you acquire the lock immediately. Um, I'm going to say more about sort of, uh, sort of what happens in there, but what you're doing there is you're essentially kind of punting to the operating system. Um, when you release a lock, uh, because that involves the pthreads library, involves parts of the operating system, uh, the operating system at that point is sort of free to bring in another thread to run, run at that point. Uh, it turns out that there are some horrible problems with that that I'm going to get to in a minute. Uh, a couple of other things about this execution model. Um, this tick business, by the way, uh, what is that all about? Um, basically, this tick uh, idea in the interpreter is that ticks are loosely mapped to interpreter instructions. Uh, if you have not seen how to disassemble Python code, by the way, uh, there's a library module dis that you can import, and then you can disassemble like a function, Python function, down into the interpreter bytecodes. Uh, this is sort of what it looks like in, inside the uh, sort of Python uh, VM. So this tick business that's executing, uh, ticks generally are one to maybe a half dozen interpreter instructions. I'm not going to go into details as to why there's not a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence, but some instructions in the machine actually run on like a shortened execution path that doesn't consume a whole, a whole tick. Uh, so they're basically these ticks uh, run in the, are sort of running in the VM. Uh, one thing that's a little bit disturbing, uh, ticks are not time-based in Python. Yeah, the print could take forever. Oh, yeah. So, so if you go back to the previous slide, that tick two. Yeah, that tick two. Line, yeah. That's going to take about a million, billion times longer <laughs> yeah. than, any, than the other three ticks all put together. Right. Uh, I so, love it. You know, another example with this, uh, I like the print one, too, uh, maybe better. I mean, if you just do something simple, like you say nums is X range of 100 million, and then you just say minus one in nums, uh, it turns out that executes as one tick. It happens to take six and a half seconds on, like, a 2.4 gigahertz processor. Um, but, you know, one thing that's, that's, that's probably worth knowing is that in this whole, like, thread scheduling model, you know, this whole tick business, um, if you're just... If you just have a thread that's just pounding the hell out of the CPU, no idea how long that's going to take. I mean, it could, t it might run in like a few microseconds, but if it's a, some thread that's doing uh, like like this a lot, that interval, I mean, it could be a minute. I mean, it's probably not a minute in most Python code, but it's 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 a non-predictable uh, sort of amount of time that's going to pass there. 
Uh, one thing that, I, that I'll also mention, uh, ticks are basically uninterruptible in the interpreter. So if you do a long running calc, like a, if you did something like minus one in nums and you start hitting control C, you're basically not going to get any response to that. Um, if you see that behavior, you're basically working with like a single you know, operation in the interpreter that's uninterruptible. Uh, actually, on that subject, I want to talk about control C. Uh, a number of people said that they'd programmed with threads before in here. How many people have programmed with threads before? Uh, how many people are really annoyed by the fact that you can't control C thread program? Do people know about this phenomenon? You write like a, a thread program, then you control C it, and then you, it doesn't work, and then you have to basically uh, kill minus nine it in some other window or something. Uh, does anybody know why that is? Okay, well, we're going to find out here. Um, there's some really interesting stuff with this signal handling in Python. Um, if any kind of signal handle, handle uh, basically arrives in the interpreter, um, the interpreter actually enters a totally different execution mode where it, tr where it, where it tries to context switch threads on every tick. Um, and what it's trying to do here is force the main execution thread to execute. Um, basically, the interpreter doesn't have any control over how the operating system uh, runs threads. So what it does is it basically you get a signal. Oh, it, I mean, it, it goes, it basically you get a signal, and then it starts, basically will start context switching every tick until the main thread can actually get scheduled and deal with the signal handler. <laughs> what? Does it use bubble sword at some point? Is that um, my data? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is actually pretty cool. Um, I, I mean, one of the things that you're, yeah, yeah pathologically cool. It, it's, it's, it's cool in that, like, you know, I've been programming Python like 13 years. I had, like, no idea. I just knew that, like, okay, there's something weird with threads, and Control-C is, like, broken. And, okay, it sucks, but, you know, I, I don't have time to go look into why that, to why that is. Um, so that's, that's pretty horrible there. Um, basically what you're seeing here um, is the fact that Python completely punts on thread scheduling, doesn't do anything with thread scheduling. Um, basically, uh, Python just basically hands off to the operating system, says, look, you go deal with thread scheduling. Um, and essentially what's happening because of that is that, uh, you know, since the interpreter doesn't have any control over how the operating system is going to schedule things, um, it's essentially just going to start thread switching as fast as it can, hoping that the main thread will come up eventually. Um, now, the reason that that control C uh, actually doesn't work, and this this is um, this is probably the big annoyance here. Uh, a common problem with threads is that the main thread often gets blocked somewhere, either on a thread join or a thread lock. Um, one of the things that's in the thread library, if you launch a whole bunch of like non-demonic threads. Uh, in Python, you probably know that the interpreter waits for all of the threads to terminate. Um, it turns out that the way that the threading library does that is it just does a thread join internally in the library. You know, if you look at the source code for threading, it does kind of a thread join to do that. Uh, the problem is thread join is uninterruptible in the operating. It's like basically an uninterruptible instruction. Uh, and what happens uh, is uh, since the main thread is like totally blocked on this thread join, it never gets to handle the signal. So when you do a control C, it basically never gets scheduled um, and you end up with a freeze. Um, the extra bonus, and this is the part I really love about this, um, not only do you not handle the control C, uh, the, interp the interpreter basically gets permanently left in a state where it tries to context switch on every tick. And there's no way to there's no way to basically change that. So uh, it's pretty cool. It's like not only can you not interrupt your program, it's going to run like hell from that point uh, ever after. So uh, so that's kind of some interesting uh, interesting behavior there. Uh, there actually is a way to get the control C. By the way, I don't know whether I have a slide on it here, but if you just give the main program like something to do even if it's like trivially stupid, like sleeping or something like that. Um, as long as you give the main thread something to do that's not like thread joining or lock or blocking, you will actually see the control C handle. So uh, there, there is a way to kind of get at that, but. Question, question. Yes. So is the lesson never, ever, ever use thread join? Pardon? So is the lesson to never use the join method? 
No, I wouldn't say that. Um, I would just say if you're going to do a join in the main execution thread, uh, be aware that you're going to block all signal handling. Or if you were, like on the main execution thread, if you were to block on like a mutex lock or something like that, you're also going to disable all signal handling. Basically, the, what I've seen a couple of programs do is they, they throw away the concept of main, and so the main thread, the one that started your program, it essentially gets set aside as a dedicated signal handler thread, and, and they create another thread that effectively becomes main that does all the work. I actually like that. I would recommend that. So what was kind of advised, you know, is basically don't do like thread weighting or lock. Basically, I would say take like the main execution thread out of your program right. and do everything else in thread. Uh, and you'll sort of avoid this uh, to some degree. That is pretty pretty cool, though. It's kind of, I never had I had no idea it was that diabolical. <laughs> so uh, I'll show an example of that in a uh, in a second. Um, uh, the other interesting thing, and this is um, something also, also I did not realize about the gill. Um, I was actually always under the impression that the gill was just like a simple lock. You know, when you talk about a lock, I tend to think about like mutex locks or something. It's just like, okay, you need a lock. You either acquire the lock or you release the lock. Uh, it turns out the gill is not a lock like that. Um, basically, the gill is implemented as what, uh, using a condition variable or a semaphore. And I'm not going to... I'm not going to go into the underlying details of that, um, but the interpreter locking in Python is really based on signaling, not lock, like acquire and release operations. Um, it basically, what's happening is if a thread uh, wants to acquire the global interpreter lock, it essentially just checks to see whether the lock, whether the lock is available or not. So it kind of does this check to say, well, is the lock free? Uh, if it is, you'll just get it and life is good. But if some other thread actually has the gill, this, this thread that wants it will basically go to sleep in the operating system. Uh, and then what happens is if the, when the other thread releases the global interpreter lock, there's actually a signal in the operating system that will wake up the other thread that was waiting for it. Uh, I have some sort of uh, some pictures that kind of uh, show this in a, in a second here. Um, but it really is kind of based on sort of signaling. And if you look at sort of how this works, it's actually uh, a lot more subtle than you might realize. Um, basically what's going to happen is uh, in, if you have some thread, like this thread one here is running, uh, essentially every uh, 100 interpreter ticks, it's going to hit that check, that check interval uh, section there. Um, and what happens there is it basically, you guys doing okay on sound? It, the, the thing is just kind of falling down a little bit here. So, um, Essentially what happens is the interpreter is hitting this like check interval, uh, and then when it does that, it just fires off a signal to any other waiting threads. So what's happening is essentially that you get all these signals going into the operating system, and the operating system is actually kind of free to do with those signals whatever it feels like. Um, let, let me do a, we're going to do a quick fix on that. Maybe I'm breathing on the mic too hard. And it's, like a, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a force coming down. Okay. Okay. But we'll, 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 we'll see if this works here. So, uh, so what you're going to have in the, uh, in the, in the OS, you know, in, your, in your program, is that this CPU bound thread here is just going to sit there and it's just going to basically fire off a constant stream of signals into the OS. Um, and what these signals are, are they're basically just an indication to the operating system saying, if you want to run another thread, go ahead. But um, it's sort of, you're sort of left up to the, op it's, it's sort of left up to the operating system as to actually when to do that. Uh, so one of the things that will happen is uh, a CPU bound thread will actually sit there and just fire off these like signals, but the, uh, the operating system may not actually act on that for some considerable amount of time later. Um, it may wait a while, and then eventually the operating system will decide that it wants to context switch, and then it will start running the other thread. Uh, it turns out that the length of time that this takes uh, on, on your system is actually related to the, to the uh, time slice in your operating system kernel. Uh, this is kind of a subtle detail, but 
Um, in, in the operating system, there's sort of a timer that says every process is given like 10 milliseconds to run, and then it will context switch after that point because you've expired your time slice. Um, if you just have two Python threads just sitting there pounding on the CPU, this thread switch actually is sort of tied up with that time slice in the operating system. It basically has a setting that says, well, you know, any thread is allowed to run 10 milliseconds, but once that's up, I'm just going to flip to something else to run. Uh, so this could actually be a considerable lag between when threads will switch. Uh, I think one, one mis maybe misperception is that that check interval in the Python interpreter actually specifies how frequently you thread switch. Uh, that's actually not the case. It's, uh, it's only just how frequently you send this signal to the operating system saying you can, you can thread switch if you want to. Now, getting back to this sort of thread scheduling thing, um, you know, I think the one thing I want to emphasize is that really, you know, Python is deferring to the operating system as to how uh, threads are going to get scheduled. And without uh, sort of going into an operating systems uh, lecture of uh, some extreme nature, uh, basically operating systems already do a lot of stuff with scheduling. I mean, inside the operating system, there's a lot of like automatic updates of like priorities of processes and threads. Uh, one really critical thing in operating systems is they tend to filter processes into CPU bound or IO bound categories. So, um, what, what's going to happen when that signal gets sent into the OS here, it's essentially going to look at all the threads that can actually run, and it's going to run the one that has the highest priority. Uh, so uh, that's, that's essentially what's happening with this, this scheduling of threads, is that you're sort of tied up in the operating system uh, to do that. And uh, now this is where things start to get interesting. Um, I want to talk about what in the world is going on with this horrible performance problem. Um, you know, so I had this example early in, earlier uh, in the talk where I had these, you know, just two CPU outbound threads, and I had put up this performance number uh, where, where I basically showed, you know, that two threads runs like twice as slow as just doing something sequentially. You get this question of what, you know, what is the source of that? Uh, and it turns out that essentially all of this gill signaling is actually the culprit behind that. Um, what's happening is that every 100 ticks of the interpreter, you have this like locking of a mutex lock. There's then this like signaling on a condition variable. Uh, in the case of having two different threads competing, uh, you're always going to have something waiting in the background. So that ends up going into the pthreads library. There's basically signaling in the operating system. Uh, because it's based on signal handling, you might end up with like signal delivery. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. And you can actually kind of observe this. Um, so here's some numbers that I, I ran on one CPU. So keep in mind, this is a single processor example. Um, if I do this sequential execution version, uh, and this is on my, my Mac, so there's sort of two different categories of system calls here. Uh, you see a few sort of low-level system calls, but once I introduce two CPU, CPU bound threads into my program, I want you to look at that. Um, basically, um, it went up from like 117 system calls to 3.3 million. That takes a while. It takes a while. I mean, that's like, you know, you can sort of, uh, it's like, whoa, um, you know, sort of look at that. Um, Just a quick question. Can yeah. you control the number of system calls with, uh, you know, the setting for the interval, which is kind of hard-coded at uh, 100? Oh, yeah, if you, uh, if you set that up to a high number, the number of system calls will drop. So, I mean, it's interesting to see a graph of this. Uh, I mean, you can, we, can actually, we can actually play with that. Um, you know, let me, uh, what did you get the, what did you use to get those numbers? I'll actually just use the uh, the Mac OS X process viewer. Yeah. So if you run like a, um, this is sort of a version of that. If you just fire up the uh, the uh, process viewer, uh, and then you do a process inspection. Uh, so this is kind of a running program. Um, you'll sort of, I don't know that you can see that in the back. Uh, sort of a large number of system calls. The question isn't why it's twice as slow. The question is why, is it, why isn't it 
10 or 20 times slower? Uh, well, operating system developers are pretty smart. Um, That's still a lot. I mean, uh, I will say that, like, you know, like signal handling and threads and the scheduling part of the operating systems, is that a lot of people look at that, a lot of research in that, it's sort of a very fundamental part of the operating system. So, you know, even though that's at, well, whoa, we're up to like uh, 10 million system calls there. Um, you know, that is a pretty highly optimized kind of pathway. Um, one of the things that you're seeing there, by the way, is um, if you go to two CPUs, it goes from 3.3 up to 9.5 million a system call. You're starting to see kind of like, you know, sort of this, you know, I mentioned that it ran faster on one CPU than it did on two CPUs uh, in, that, in that intro slide. Uh, that's actually part of the effect there. I mean, basically, when you go to two CPUs, you end up with even more system calls than you had before with just one CPU. Uh, the other thing with two CPUs, uh, since I just ran an example of that, I would really like to have somebody explain this number for me up here. This is kind of a summary of the, of the process. Why is it using 136% of the CPU? It meant, it meant that 100% of the time, you, you were, 100% would mean that you perfectly matched the amount of work to be done to the number of CPUs and the power of the CPUs that you had. At 136%, that means 36% of the time, there was something waiting to happen that had no core to run on. Uh, that's not how I, I well, I, I don't think that's how I interpret it. I mean, basically on this system, since it has two cores, 200% is basically full utilization of both well, that cores. Would be, that would be like an uptime variable, but I don't think the Mac, I don't believe Activity Monitor expresses that number that way. I don't, I don't okay, I have, to, I have to check on that, but um, uh, as far as I understand this, this is basically, like, if you just run this thing, it's basically showing, like, full utilization of one core plus, like, a 30% utilization of the other core. Um, that's a little bit disturbing. It's like, I thought Python was single, I thought it was single-threaded, so why is it on two cores not only using one CPU but, like, a substantial chunk of the, uh, of the other one? I'm going to run that again, by the way, because I want to show you something else. Um, so this is basically, if you can see that, uh, it's sitting there uh, running at 133% CPU. Um, I mentioned earlier about this pathological behavior with the control C. So if I, can, if I do a control C on that and then go back to the process viewer, uh, look at the CPU time goes up to like 183%. Uh, basically, that's what you're seeing there is the interpreter is like trying to context switch every tick, and it's just like totally hammered at that point. So. Yeah, I do have a sequ I do have a sequential version. So. If you run sequentially, um, I believe it will give you 100%. This is a this is a purely sequential version. It's like 99.6 percent. So. Yeah, he looks at the if you run uptime right now. Hit Control Z and then BG real quick. And now one, two, three. Run uptime. Just run another copy of it. Finish the question. Okay, I'm wrong. Okay, <laughs> yeah. no, it's it, it's 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 fine. But I think it is a uh, it is a little bit disturbing that you have this like Python interpreter. Like, not only is it doing like 10 million system calls, but it's just sitting there like pounding on like one and a half CPU. That's a little uh, a little bit on the dis at least I'm disturbed by that. Um, so uh, I actually did some uh, kind of low level uh, investigation of this. Um, so. One of the things I was a little curious about is like, what is going on in the interpreter to explain this behavior? I mean, I basically know that there's all this signaling going on and there's you know, the check interval and so forth. Um, I actually modified the interpreter slightly to record a real-time trace of all operations on the gill and who did it and when it happened. Um, I'm not gonna say so much about the mechanics of that here. I mean, you can send me email, I'll send you the code. 
Um, but the output of that, uh, I basically got these, generated these trace files. It looks something like this. And I'm going to show you a, sort of an example in a second. Uh, but I did these traces where I recorded sort of what thread ID is running. So that's what this T2 or T1 is. I have some different codes in here, like entry means that you're about to try and acquire to the, the gill. Uh, acquire means that you're trying to acquire the gill. Release means you released it. Uh, a busy means that you actually tried to get the gill, but it was, it was used by some other thread at the moment. Uh, and then a retry basically means that you got woken up to, to reacquire the gill, but for whatever reason it was busy again by the time you got around to checking it. Uh, so I kind of did these traces, and um, as a result of looking at that, uh, what's happening on multiple cores is that the operating system basically will schedule two Python threads at the same time, and then they have a gill battle. Um, so all, all of that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that, all that churning on the on the CPU. Um, there's a little bit of it, it, there's sort of a timing scenario coming getting into play here, where this thread one, the way that it, it basically switches is it just releases the gill and reacquires it. But, but since you have another CPU core, the operating system can basically keep the original thread running, and then it will wake up some other thread, basically saying, "Well, you just got a signal." So obviously somebody wants you to run if you can. Basically we'll wake it up uh, and then this fails because the gill has already been acquired by the time it... What's going to happen is it's got to release the gill, send the signal, the other thread has to wake up, acquire the gill before the first thread tries to acquire the gill. And Again, the and right. Right, because those two instructions are right next to each other. And so the... what ends up happening is you end up... I bet if you looked at the actual progress that you make through your job, you end up with effectively sequential thread one, sequential thread two, with a hellacious amount of overhead to do it. Yeah. I mean, part of the problem is that uh, it's not totally sequential because one of the things that happens is the operating system for CPU bound threads, they eventually drop in priority to a point where the OS uh, is just like, I'm going to run well, something else. But uh, what does happen, if you look at the traces, you can actually see this in the trace. Um, I don't know whether this is going to make any sense, but um, what, you can, what you can see um, in the trace is there's like a weird sequencing that's going on where, um, I'll, I'll try to point it out here. Uh, what, what's happening uh, where the mouse, I don't know if you can see where the mouse is, but this, like, this T1 here is basically releasing the gill, and then it immediately retries to basically reacquire it because that's the way that that code works. Um, and what's happening is this release operation is sending a signal to T2, but by the time T2 gets scheduled, the gill is already like in gone. So what you end up happening is you get this like bounce, I don't know whether to call it bouncing, but basically T2 is like waking up, going to sleep, waking up, going to sleep repeatedly uh, like hundreds of times before it can actually get the gill. Uh, and uh, the, the, the numbers on this are actually really uh, surprising. When I say hundreds of like cycles here, I do mean hundreds. Uh, uh, in some of these traces, I actually saw it as high as like 1,400 failed attempts to reacquire the gill. I mean, basically, it's just sitting there like hammering on the on the gill, trying to get that. Um, and so you end up with this like really pathological uh, sort of scheduling uh, issue in, inside the uh, interpreter there. Um, and I think what you're really seeing here, I mean, this is, this is why I actually find this pretty interesting. Um, you're actually having a battle between conflicting goals here. This is, I think this is really neat. Um, basically, what you have in Python is you have this mode where Python is saying, well, I only want to run single-threaded, but I don't want anything to do with thread scheduling. Thread scheduling is hard. That's operating system stuff. So I'm just going to punt on thread scheduling. Um, but then what you have in the operating system is it's basically sitting there saying, ooh, you know, okay, multiple cores, you know, shiny cores. I like cores. So uh, the, the OS is just going to basically aggressively schedule as much as possible on the cores as soon as possible. So what you end up having are basically these two things are going to fight with each other where, you know, it's like Python, you know, saying, well, I don't want to run, I don't want multiple threads, but I don't want to schedule. And the OS doesn't really know that that's going on. Um, 
Another thing that's a little bit disturbing about this, um, this also shows up even if you have one CPU bound thread. Um, and this is actually the case that I'm actually more interested in. Um, I actually think there's a lot of applications out there where you're going to have like one thread that's doing a fair amount of number crunching and then you might have like a set of other threads that are maybe doing like support operations or like I.O. operations or some kind of background processing uh, to basically help out this CPU bound thread. Uh, one case that I can think of is actually the async stuff. Like if you, if you were trying to do like a blocking operation with an async framework, one of the approaches that people take is to basically take the blocking operation, put it off into some thread, and then you let the, the event loop like pound on stuff in parallel with that. Um, so you could imagine like this thread one is basically some event loop just like pounding the hell out of the CPU. And then maybe this thread two is some kind of blocking operation that for whatever reason has been put off into its own execution thread. Uh, what happens with that is there's a really, uh, you also get this situation that if some kind of IO operation comes into this thread two, it has a hell of a time getting the gill. I mean, basically, if this event loop or whatever it is is pounding on the CPU, uh, if any kind of uh, I.O. happens over here, like maybe a network packet arrives or some kind of event, uh, this thing is basically going to try to acquire the gill, and you're going to end up in the same battle that you had before. I mean, basically, that CPU-bound process is just going to mostly win the battle for gill uh, acquisition, and um, you're going to get that same behavior. Uh, this is actually sort of a, another trace that I did where uh, I had a sort of a CPU bound uh, process just kind of running. And then I basically fired in like a network packet at some point into another thread. So it basically shows up somewhere in the bottom here. And what you're seeing here is this thread T1 is like waking up saying, hey, I got a network packet. Uh, can't run right away because the gill is busy. And then it ends up in this fight with the CPU bound event loop. Um, in just this one example I did here, um, it actually took 16,000 ticks for the IO bound thread to actually get the gill. So, um, so essentially from the arrival of the IO, you're talking about like a very significant number of, of basically ticks going on. And then on top of that, this is the real clincher on it, it only executed for three ticks. I mean, it's I.O. bound. It doesn't do anything. So um, you end up with this I.O. bound thread. First of all, it has to wait 16,000 ticks to run. And then when it does run, it basically acquired and released the lock in like three interpreter ticks. That's kind of, I don't think that's very cool or it's not very desirable uh, anyway. How that would probably manifest itself in your program is like a really poor response time. Um, and it might not even be that perceptible, but uh, you know, it, it might be the difference between like a response time in microseconds versus a response time like on the order of five milliseconds. Okay, maybe it's not perceptible to like the human eye if you're just like typing on the keyboard, but uh, for other things you would notice that. Uh, and what you're really seeing there, um, it's, it's actually kind of a weird form of a priority inversion. Uh, this is something that you talk about in operating systems a little bit, but uh, one of the perils of threads is that in certain programs you can get this situation where a, like a low priority thread basically blocks the execution of a high priority thread. And that's actually what you're getting here. Um, as far as the operating system is concerned, any kind of CPU bound processing tends to be low priority. And any kind of I.O. bound processing tends to be high priority. And what you're getting here is basically the this, this CPU bound thread is just preventing the I.O. bound thread from executing. And uh, probably the, the interesting thing is that this basically only happens when you're on multi-core. Um, I don't have slides on it, but if you would take all of this code and run it on one CPU, um, all of this stuff goes away. I mean, basically, if you're on one processor and you get an incoming I.O. packet, the next time the operating system gets signaled by Python, it looks at all of the threads and basically says, look, there's this high priority I.O. thread that can run. I'm going to run it right now. And so you'll actually uh, see uh, this, this T2 be preemptive, like preempted immediately, basically. Uh, so as far as some comments on this, uh, I'm basically almost done here. Um, I'm not even sure if anybody's looking at this. I looked at the Python. I've been, I've been messing around with Python for a while. 
Um, I went back and looked at Python 152. I don't remember when that came out, but it's been a while, like 1998 or something like that. Uh, and the Gill code in 152 looked virtually identical to Python 3.0. Okay, so, I mean, the Gill has, has not really uh, been on sort of the development path there. Um, and I'm not even sure whether people are looking at it because it seems like most of the discussion on the Gill is about getting rid of the Gill as opposed to changing the Gill. I mean, I think if I you know, start my news group on changing the gill, I'd probably get like a big flame war or something. Like that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's like you basically have these like two poles where it's like there's like this group that's like, ah, eh, we don't want to change the gill because it's too hard. And then you have this group that wants to totally get rid of it. Um, wh what's going on? I mean, I, I'm sort of in the, in the camp that maybe there's like some middle ground that is probably worth studying if, if, if somebody wants to. Um, I'm actually really... I think it's really interesting that there is this pretty severe performance penalty for using threads on multi-core and the fact that there's this bizarre priority inversion with I.O. Um, I think if the gill is going to stay in Python, I would hope that somebody would look into this. I mean, it's, maybe it's just like a subtle thing that would never, never come up, but it, it just seems really odd to me. And it may be something that is sort of off the radar a little bit because a lot of the code for this was sort of developed before everybody's machine had multiple CPU cores in it. Um, as far as some open questions, I don't have the slightest idea how in the hell you would fix it. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I mean, I used to teach operating systems at U of C, so it's, you know, it's like reasonably familiar with threads and locking and, and, and so forth. And I'm looking at this and it's just like, I don't know. I mean, it seems like whatever the solution to this would be, it would either be really hard or really subtly tricky in some way that's not entirely obvious. Um, it basically, Python just needs to cooperate with the operating system so that instead of dropping the gill and immediately trying to reacquire it, Python stops and says, drop the gill, tell the operating system, hey, if you've got another thread to run, run it. Do what you want. If you don't have another thread to run, Grab the kill. See, right. I mean, the tricky thing with that, so this is where it gets tricky. Like, if you had two CPU bound threads, yeah, you'd then you'd end up with this massive amount of context switching. Like, well, that would so, be what you want, though. I bet if you actually did that massive amount of context switching back and forth, you would still end up with a faster runtime than this pathological case you've got here. What I really want to do is print these slides out, staple them to a dead monkey, and mail it to Guido. <laughs> <laughs> He'll probably hear that. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> just, just, just as an observation on that, by the way, I, I actually did modify the Python interpreter as part oh, of this. No, 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 no <laughs> I, I like Guido fine. Uh, I actually did modify the interpreter to change the gill into just a simple mutex lock. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do that, uh, one of the things in the in P threads and operating systems is there actually is scheduling on locking. There's sort of a notion of like fair lock use uh, that, right. that will alternate. Basically, I did that, and it, it, you actually got this behavior of the interpreter literally thread ping switch. Back. It ping pong back and forth on every check interval. Um, I don't remember what the performance of it was, but this, ex this excess CPU load problem totally went away. I mean, it, went, it basically went down to like a back down to 100% because it was essentially using the operating system uh, to sort of help it out. There's a question in the back so there. Just to, just to close the door on this, it seems like the Python model looks a lot like Garrett's slide where you know, there's, a, there's a scheduler you know, that allocates um, you know, a thread to processes that are running. I don't know whether there is a schedule. I mean, if there's a scheduler, it's basically the operating system. It's, but it's, it's, the, not, it's not the operating system. It's this, um, I mean, the operating system allocates thread to this you know, to the guild, uh, and the guild is kind of the master of this. I mean, it has to schedule these things. I mean, yeah, I mean, there isn't really a scheduler, but I mean, what's happening is Python is basically just signaling the operating system. Uh, you can almost think about it as giving the OS hints in a way, where it's just saying, well, here, uh, you know, the operating system, you go ahead and thread switch if you want to, but it's not actually telling the operating system to actually, like, thread switch, for instance. Yeah, there was a comment in the back. So. Do you happen to know what other languages that are similarly implemented, like Ruby, do about this problem? I have no idea. Um, I would suspect that they have something, you know, similar issues uh, to this, but.
I do know that the Erlang dam recently just sort of got multi-core down, even though ironically they built their own story around currency. Just recently, though, their dam fixed. I don't know the details, of it, but it was like you know 18 months. Like, so this is apparently a problem that's introduced by you know, to, to the, uh, a, uh, an interpreted language by multi-core, probably because people are punting. Probably everyone's punting red management to the OS, and they, I imagine it's. I mean, I mean, one of the things I think is interesting about this is like the original implementation of the gill is actually pretty intelligent because, um, in, 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 yeah, because on like, I mean, basically what they're doing is they're saying, look, the operating system, those guys are smart. They know how to code. They know how to write schedulers. Why in the hell would we write our own scheduler in Python? And so they're actually doing, I think, the right thing. I mean, they're basically saying, hey, OS, do the scheduling. On one CPU, the OS worked great for that. It's going to do all the right priority scheduling. I.O. bound jobs are going to run before CPU bound jobs. Um, what's interesting about it is it just all completely falls on its face once you go to multi-core because then you get this extra OS behavior where the OS is saying, well, I'm going to use as many cores as I can. And then you end up with all this like battle over the gill going on. Yeah, some more questions in the back. I'm under the impression that... Uh the multi-processing module got kind of fast-tracked into the standard library, partially because of like, well, instead of yeah, fixing the gill is hard, let's go multi-processing uh, multi module instead. Um, <laughs> did you do you use that, uh, or or do you have any thoughts on? Well, I think the multi-processing module is cool. Um, I don't think it was added to Python to address any issue with the uh, gill per se, but I mean, there's actually a whole class of. To use multi -core. Yeah, well, I don't even know it was multi core, but I mean, message passing, I mean, the multi processing module is heavily geared at sort of inter process communication and message passing. Uh, and that is a very, you know, sort of a well established way to do parallel programming. So uh, I think that I think that module is actually really great because it sort of addresses you know sort of a different class of programming styles for parallel computing. It does address limitations of the gill. I mean, for CPU bound stuff, if you can if you can actually figure out a way to structure your problem so that it can live on multiple processes, it actually works great for that. <laughs> oh well, one one thing I one, I do have a couple of other comments on this. Well, I, I do have another question, maybe. Okay. Related, we are talking here about C Python, which I guess or it's still in version yeah. three. It's not really settled what to do with it, and you're saying there's not a lot of talk about it. But there are other uh, interpreter communities. There's PyPy and the LLVM stuff. But they have they're dealing with very similar problems, and I haven't looked at it in, in a year. But they were actually talking about something different. But it was again this, the same kind of ideas. Do we do we throw away the gill entirely? So your solution is interesting. And this is uh, my promise uh, to you. I will look into Jython and see how it was handled there. Because I'm also worried that if, the, if this issue is fixed, you will have a lot of broken code out there that's really suddenly broken because people have already programmed according to this. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't have a good sense for whether it would break break code or not. Well, but control C stuff, for example, how people handle the main thread. And, um, I mean, people have their own hacks and sometimes they don't always understand how they work exactly, but people found solutions to this. And they might be unnecessary or not work according to how you expect once you don't have this Well, I don't know. They, they have to make it life interesting for people too, you know. There's not, um, there's not a ton of CPU bound apps that we would run into, right? And if you're running into those, you're into parallel processing and you're probably using something else anyway. That's probably why this hasn't bit majorly. The concurrency issue for Python developers generally is I/O stuff. I would I would agree on that. Like most people probably have not run into this because of I/O handling. I think my interest in it though. Um, I think, I, I don't know, I mean, I think it's probably worth trying to fix this if only just to have like somewhat more predictable thread behavior on multi-core. Um, and I actually do think it might actually have an impact on like, on programs that have like, um, you know, like a mix of CPU and I.O. I mean, I think there actually are programs that have like at least maybe one CPU, somewhat maybe one thread that's dominated by a lot of CPU processing. Uh, and if that's mixed up with some I/O processing, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I think this 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 would uh, may help out. I'm also a little bit concerned about how about some of these libraries like multiprocessing, for instance, that was uh, mentioned. 
Uh, some of those libraries actually use threads in the background to do some assistance with how they, they operate. Um, and because they are using threads in the background, you kind of have this situation where threads and I.O. are kind of, well, like threads, I.O. and CPU processing are kind of mixed together. I sort of wonder whether, um, you know, addressing this would actually help those libraries in just like very subtle ways, like would it improve their response time? Would it uh, re improve like their I.O. throughput? Um, you know, there's a lot of just like really subtle things like that. Uh, so that's about it. Um, I'm actually not working on any patches or code related to this. Um, instead, I'm working on that Twitter log handler. Uh, thing. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I will say that, that, that this does interest me a lot. Uh, if there are students here, uh, you know, having been a professor before and all that, all that kind of stuff, I actually think this problem, if somebody would, were, were to dive into it, you could probably get an interesting conference paper. Uh, at a pretty major conference on this, um, not not like PyCon, but like I think you could probably get a paper at like a like a Usenix conference or like an operating systems conference or programming languages conference. Uh, I think it's definitely like a hard problem uh, to look at, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that could be done. Uh, if you are interested in hacking on this, uh, just send me email, and I'll send you like the modified Python interpreter. Or anything else you want to know about it. So uh, that's basically it. Um, only other thing I'll say is uh, buy the next Python Essential Reference, which is at the printer right now. So <laughs> we'll be out in a few weeks. So. Okay.